2 Samuel part 5 uh, this will be Bible study number 11 of this series we have seen the death of Absalom as he got his head and hair caught in the boughs of an oak tree and Joab had run him through with the spear and ten men of uh, the men that were pursuing after him killed him and um, this was strictly against the king's orders but Joab knew and had uh, wisdom enough to know that if they left Absalom alive that he would rise again against his father so they killed him and threw him into a pit and again he is symbolic of Satan the Antichrist when he shall come and um, his fate was similarly the same in the end of course Satan will be destroyed and of course the king is uh, upset about this for when he received tidings of it he was sorrowful and mournful as any father would be over the loss of his son even a son that hated him and he is now weeping aloud as I'm sure our father will probably weep on the day when he has to cast some of his own children into the lake of fire and burn them up and cause the death of their souls as written in the book of Revelation in the last chapters concerning judgment the great white throne judgment and the second death but this is where we're going to pick up and we're going to pick up in 2 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 1 and before we do as always let us go to our Father's throne and ask for wisdom and guidance as we study this, His Most Holy Word. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this day. And we ask, Father, that you lead us and guide us and give us of your wisdom to understand these things through type and example and through literal. And we ask that your hand always be upon these studies, Father that all that is taught here is by your will and by your truth and we also ask Father that you open the eyes and ears of all who study with us that they too may receive truth and understanding as they take the time and care enough to study your word in depth and we ask these things Father in the name of our Lord and Savior Yeshua Messiah Jesus Christ Amen so 2 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 1 And it was told to Joab, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. Verse 19 And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. In other words, what should have been victory that the king's enemy had been destroyed turned into mourning because the king is very distraught about this. For the people heard say that day how the king grieve, was grieved for his son. And of course any man would be grieved for his son if he cared about him, which he did care about Absalom, regardless of what Absalom had done. As our Lord and Savior, or as our Father even, uh, being one and the same, cares about his children who sin against him, though he will correct them. Verse 3. And the people got them by stealth that day into the city, as people ashamed steal away when they flee, for, flee in battle. In other words, they came in very quietly and very solemnly, not really uh, wanting to make themselves known, verse 4. And the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son, verse 5. And Joab came into the house of the king and said, Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved thy life and the lives of thy sons and thy daughters and the lives of thy wives and the lives of thy concubines. Verse 6. In that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. And... Um, 
hatest here is probably a little bit of a strong word. In other words, you have more regard for your lost son than you do for those that have stood loyal with you all this time and have fought with you. For thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither prince nor servants. For this day I perceived that if Absalom had lived, and we had all died this day, then it had pleased thee well. In other words, you would rather that if Absalom had have lived and killed us all. And if Absalom had lived, he probably would have killed them all, because it was his intent to take the kingdom from his father. Verse 7. Now therefore arise and go forth and speak comfortably. In other words, console and uh, encourage these people unto thy servants. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not one tarry with thee this night. And that will be worse unto thee than to all the evil that is befell thee from thy youth until now. Verse 8. Then the king, obviously moved by his words, arose and sat at the gate. And they told unto all the people, saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate. And all the people came before the king, for Israel had fled every man to his tent. In other words, they returned back into the king. Verse 9. And all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king saved us out of the hand of our enemies, and he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled out of the land of Absalom, or for Absalom. In other words, for his own son, for his own seed. In other words, he, he's fought all these great enemies and um, conquered all these peoples. And the Lord has given him victory and now he's fled from his own son. Verse 10. And Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now therefore, why speak ye not a word of bringing the king back? In other words, everybody's being quiet about this. Uh, no one has said, let's get King David back uh, upon the throne and back over the kingship. Verse 11. And King David sent to, Dezak, to Zadok and to Abiathar the priests, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, Why are ye the last to bring up the king to his house? Seeing the speech of all Israel is coming to the king, even to his house. In other words, out of all the tribes... Israel is uh, more willing to bring him back to the house than his own tribe, Judah. Verse 10, or verse 12. Ye are my brethren, and my bones and my flesh. Wherefore, or why then, are ye the last to bring up the king? In other words, to reestablish me to the throne. Verse 13. And say ye to Amasa, Thou art not of my bone, and not of my flesh? God do so to me, and more also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. In other words, he's talking to the tribe of uh, Judah here, and uh, they were the first to put him on the throne, yet they're the last to want to bring him back to the throne now that Absalom is dead. Verse 14. And he bowed the heart of the men of Judah. In other words, he shamed them. He uh, humbled them as the heart of one man. So they sent this word unto the king, Return thou and all thy servants. Verse 15. So the king returned and came to Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king to conduct him over Jordan. Verse 16. And Shimei, the son of Giza, a Benjamite, who was of Baharim, hasted to come down with the men of Judah to meet the king. Now this Shimei, as you recall, is the one that was cursing David and throwing stones and dust at him uh, because the Lord had moved him to do so. He was of the house of Saul. Verse 18. And there went over a ferry boat to carry the king's to carry over the king's household, and to do what he thought good. And Shimei the son of Gerah fell down before the king, 
as he was come over Jordan. In other words, he's fallen in respect to the king. Verse 19. And said unto the king, Let not the Lord impute iniquity unto me, neither do thou remember, or let not my Lord impute iniquity. In other words, any case you, anytime you see the word Lord in lowercase, it's referring to the king or whoever is in power at the time that is being addressed. In this case, it's David. So, lowercase l on Lord does not mean the Lord God Almighty. It will be uh, uppercase or capital L if it is concerning the Lord. But this one Shimei who had cursed King David said unto him, Let not my Lord impute iniquity unto me, neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely in the day that the Lord King went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. Verse 20. For thy servant doth know that I have sinned, Therefore, behold, I am come the, uh, the first this day of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet the Lord, the King, or my Lord, the King. Verse 21. In other words, he's being apologetic here for the way that he treated David. And he was mad at him because he was of the uh, children of Saul. Verse 21. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this, because he hath cursed the Lord's anointed? And again, there you see the word Lord in uppercase, which means the Lord God Almighty. Verse 22. And David said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah, that ye should this day be adversaries unto me? In other words, I'm king here. I'll make the decisions. Why are you uh, standing up and opposing me? Shall there be any man put to death this day in Israel? For do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? Verse 23. Therefore the king said to Shimei, Thou shalt not die. And the queen swear unto him. Verse 24. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and neither had dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes since the day the king parted, until the day he came again in peace. In other words, since David departed, he had not bathed, or shaved, or done anything towards cleanliness. Verse 25. In other words, he was in mourning. Verse 25. And it came to pass... When he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest thou not with me, Mephibosheth? Verse 26. And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass, that I may ride thereon to go to the king, because thy servant is lame. Verse 27. And he hath slandered thy servant unto my king, or unto my lord the king. But my lord the king is as an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. In other words, we're talking about Zeba here, who had uh, delivered the food to the king, but uh, had left Mephibosheth behind after apparently telling Mephibosheth that he was going to take him with him. He either... Uh, thought he was going to be a burden or he was trying to suck up to the king or he was uh, preparing himself to play both sides of the field here to uh, give King David food in his time of need but also to be loyal to Absalom. It's actually not written what his motives were but you can pretty well be self-assured that he had his own motives at heart. Verse 28. And all of my father's house were but dead men before the Lord the King. Yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat of thine own table? What right therefore have I to cry any more unto the King? In other words, you've been good enough to me as it is. What right have I got to say anything or ask anything of you? Verse 29. And the King said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said thou and Ziba divide the land. Verse 30. 
But Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take it all, for as much as the Lord the king is come again in peace unto his own house. In other words, he's not worried about the land. Verse 31. And Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Merigillim and went over Jordan with the king to conduct him over Jordan. Verse 32. Now Barzillai was a very aged man, even fourscore years old. In other words, he was 80 years old. And he had provided the king's sustenance while he lay in Manhanaim, and he was a very great man. Verse 33. And the king said unto Barzillai, Come thou over with me, and I will feed thee with me in Jerusalem. Verse 34. And Barzillai said unto the king, How long have I to live, that I should go over with the king to Jerusalem? In other words, in the form of a question. Verse 35. I am this day fourscore years old, and can I discern between good and evil? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear the voice of singing men and of singing women? In other words, I'm old. I can't taste that well. Uh, I cannot, um, my mind is going. Therefore, I cannot discern between good and evil. Uh, this is uh, not that he doesn't know right from wrong. It's just that he's, he's getting on up in years and he's not as sharp as he was. And uh, can I any more hear the singing of men and women? In other words, he's going deaf. He's an old man. Wherefore then thy, should thy servant be yet a burden unto the, my lord the king? In other words, why should I come over and be a burden unto you? Verse 36. Thy servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king. And why should the king recompense at me with such a reward? Verse 37. Let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again. In other words, talking about himself, that I may die in my own city and be buried in the grave of my father and of my mother. Behold, thy servant Shemham, let him go over with my lord the king, and do to him what seemeth good to thee. Verse 38. And the king answered, Shemham shall go over with me, and I will do to him that which seem good unto thee. And whatsoever thou shalt require of me, that I will do for thee. Verse 39. And all the people went over Jordan. And when the king was come over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him. And he returned unto his people, or unto his own people. Verse 40. Then the king went on to Gilgal, and Shemham went on with him. For all the people of Judah conducted the king, also half of the people of Israel. Verse 41. And behold, all the men of Israel came to the king, and said unto the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen thee away, and have brought the king and his household? And David's men that were with him over Jordan. Verse 42. And all the men of Judah answered, the men of Israel, Because the king is near kin to us. Wherefore, be angry for this matter. In other words, why are you mad about this? Have we eaten at all of the king's cost? Or hath he given us gift? In other words, we're doing this out of loyalty because he, he is of our tribe. He is of our people. And actually, he was of all their people because they're all Israel, but they are of his particular tribe. Verse 43. And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten parts in the king. We have also more right to David than ye. In other words, we outnumber you. There are ten tribes of us. And at this time, Judah and Benjamin are mer merging into one tribe. Uh, why then did ye despise us, that our advice should not be first in bringing, the king, uh, bringing, bringing back our king? In other words, the Israelites... Uh, that were not of the tribe of Judah, were the first to want to bring King David back. And the word of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. In other words, the uh, men of Judah spake more harshly than the men of Israel, you know, because this was their king, 
However, they were the last to uh, want to bring him over. The children of Israel had wanted to bring King David back first. 2 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 1. And there happened to be there a man of Belial. In other words, a troublemaker, a worthless man, uh, one of destruction, maybe even a Kenite, whose name was Sheba the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And um, he may have been a Benjamite, but um, as you know, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin are who the uh, Kenites were most prevalent among. They were um, they were actually amongst all the tribes of Israel, but uh, this person could be called a Benjamite and still be a Kenite because of land association. In other words, if this Kenite dwelled in the land of Benjamin, then he would have been considered a Benjamite. Uh, it's not known whether he was a Kenite or a real Benjamite because it's simply not written. But most of the time when you see a troublemaker arise, uh, it's, it's a fair bet that they're a Kenite. But it could just be an angry Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part with David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. In other words, leave it. Let's go. Verse 2. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba the son of Bichri and the men of Judah clave unto their king and uh, from Jordan even unto Jerusalem. Verse 2. And it came to pass or it, and David came to his house at Jerusalem and the king took the ten women his concubines whom he had left to keep the house and put them in ward and fed them but went not in unto them and they were shut up until the day of their death living in widowhood in other words he didn't go into them uh, to know them in the biblical sense verse 4 then said the king to Amasa assemble the men of Judah within three days and be thou present Verse 4. Now this Amasa is the one that was loyal to uh, Absalom in the beginning. Verse 5. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, and he tarried longer than the set time which had he had appointed him, which he, King David, had appointed him. In other words, he was longer than the three-day period. Verse 6. And David said to Abishai, now shall Sheba the son of Bichri do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou the Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get him to fence cities and escape us. Verse 7. And there went out after him Joab's men, and the Cherethites, and the Peleothites, and the mighty men, and they went out of Jerusalem or out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba the son of Bichri. Verse 8. And when they were at the great stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa went before them, and Joab's garment he had put on was girded on, unto him, and upon it a girdle with the sword fastened upon his loins. And the sheath thereof, as he went forth, it fell out. In other words, the sheath of the sword. So now all he has is the sword. Verse 9. And Joab said to Amasa, Art thou in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by his beard with the right hand to kiss him. In other words, this is a deception. Verse 10. But Amasa took no heed of the sword that was in Joab's hand, so he smote him therewith in the fifth rib. And shut out his bowels upon the ground. And struck him not again. And he died. So Joab, the son of Abishai, the brother pursued after Sheba. And after the son of Bichri. Verse uh, 11. And one of Joab's men stood by him. And said, He that favoreth Joab... And he that is for David, let him go after Joab. In other words, follow Joab. 
Verse 12. And Amasa wallowed in the blood in the midst of the highway. And when the men saw that the people stood still, in other words, they're kind of uh, awestruck by this because Amasa was of the uh, other people, in other words, the Israelites, or representative of the Israelites, whereas these were the men of Judah. He removed Amasa from the highway into the field and cast a cloth upon him when he saw that everyone that came by him stood still. In other words, they, they were rubbernecking. They stopped and looked at him laying there. This is the guy that had been their captain, verse 13. And he was removed out of the highway, and all the people went up after Joab to pursue Sheba the son of Bichri. Verse 14. And he went through all the tribes of Israel unto Abel, and to Beth Makkah, and to all the Berites that were gathered together, and also after him, and went also after him. Verse 15. And they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Makkah. In other words, this is a town, Abel. And they cast up a bank against the city, and it stood in the trench. And all the people that were there, and all the people that were with Joab, rather, battered the wall to throw it down. In other words, they're battling the wall here of Abel to uh, tear it down so they can get to this bickery, or this uh, uh, Sheba son of bickery, verse 16. Then cried a wise woman of the city, Hear, hear, say I pray you unto Joab. Come near hither that I may speak with thee. Verse 17. And when he was come near unto her, the woman said, Art thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then she said unto him, Hear thou the words of thy handmaid. And he answered, I do hear. Verse 18. Then she spake, saying, they were wont to speak in old times, saying, They shall surely ask counsel at Abel. So ended the matter. In other words, in times past, they would come and ask counsel of the uh, people of Abel. In other words, they would ask counsel rather than just coming in and trying to beseech the city. Verse 19. And I am one of them that are peaceful and faithful in Israel. Thou seekest to destroy the city and a mother of Israel? Why will thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Verse 20. And Joab answered and said, Far be it! Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. Verse 21. The matter is not so. In other words, th this is not true. But a man of Mount Ephraim... Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, hath lifted his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said unto Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to thee over the wall. Verse 22. Then the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and cast it out unto Joab. And he blew a trumpet, and they retired, from the city, every man to his tent, and Joab returned unto the king. Now, you even have a type in this spiritually of uh, a death blow to the head, and this one troublemaker who uh, is killed, and uh, the, the trumpet sounded. And again, it's only a type. Of course, Satan will not be killed at the seventh trump. He will be thrown into the pit. As I explained in the last lecture, the day of the Lord shall come to pass, and he will be loosed again, and those that follow him at that time will go to hell with him. Verse 23. Now Joab was over all the host of Israel, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was, or Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and over the Pelethites. And Adarim was over the tribute, and Jehoshaphat of Ahilud was recorder. 
verse 25. And Shiva was the scribe, and Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And Ira, also the Jerathite, was chief ruler about David. Now, these events, as they were recorded, you, you see here you've got Sheba the scribe. They were scribed down and taken down um, during these times. And that is how they come to be written in this book. Because many times people have asked me, well, how does... You'll read somewhere in the Bible where something was said not in the presence of uh, the writer of the book or not in the presence of whoever was being addressed. How did they know what was said? Well, there are ears everywhere. And there are um, people who kept records through scribeship of everything that happened. And again, that is how these words come to be written in the books of the Bible. <clears throat> Oftentimes you'll see where something was discussed out of the earshot of, uh, you know, maybe the person who's writing the book. And um, word gets around, and people did keep notes on both sides of the field. In other words, uh, I'm sure the things that happened with Absalom were written down by his own scribes, and the things that happened on David's side were captured by his scribes, and once you put all these together, then you've got the full story. So, 2 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 1. Then there was famine in the days of David three years. Year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. Verse 2. And the king... In, in other words, um, David called the Gibeonites and said unto them, "Now the Gib uh, and said unto them, now there is a you'll notice here there's parentheses. The Gibeonites were not of the tribe of Judah, but were the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal." to the children of Israel, and to the children of Israel, uh, Judah. Um, the Gibeonites were part of the Amorites, which in uh, several times we've read that the Ammonites and the Amorites, which were of Moab, Moabites even, uh, their land was not to be touched. There was to be a border established. And unless they came against Israel, they were not to be messed with. But Saul and his zeal had messed with them. So... Therefore, we've got this curse, this famine that's come upon the land. Verse 3. Wherefore, David said unto the Gibeonites, this is picking up from where he called them, uh, between the, uh, af before and after the parentheses, in other words. And David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you, wherewith I shall make atonement, that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? Verse 4. And the Gibeonites said unto him, we have no silver nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither for us shall thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, what shall, ye say, what shall ye say that I will do for you? And he said, in other words, David, King David, said, what ye say that I shall do for you. Verse 5. And they answered in King the king, the man that consumed us and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in the coast of Israel, verse 6, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose, and the king said, I will give them. Verse 7. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. In other words, he being David's best friend, uh, Jonathan. It's no wonder he saved his son. Because the Lord's oath was between them and between Jonathan and David, the son of Saul. Verse 8. 
But he took the two sons of Rizpah and the daughter of Aiah, whom she did bear unto Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up from Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Meholathite. And he delivered them in the hands of the Gibeonites. And they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days at the beginning of the barley harvest. Verse 10. And Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread upon the rock from the beginning of the harvest until uh, water dropped upon them out of heaven, in other words, till it began to rain, and suffered neither birds nor air to rest upon them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. Verse 11. And it was told to David that Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. Verse uh, 12. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh-Gilead, who had buried them, by the way, which had stolen them from the street of uh, Bethshan, where the Philistines had hanged them. And stolen is not the correct word here, is they had gathered them. When the Philistines had slain Saul in Gilboa. Verse 13. Uh, and uh, probably the reason they use the word stole here is um, not because they went in as thieves to steal them, but they stole them from the Philistines. In other words, the Philistines had hung them up. So, uh, really, they were gathering them, and I guess you could say they did steal them from the Philistines, but it, it's not the connotation of the word stole that we think today. In other words, they didn't go and steal or grave rob to get them. Verse 13. And he brought them thence, the bones of Saul, and the bones of Jonathan his son, and gathered the bones of them that were hanged. Verse 14. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan and his sons were buried in the country of Benjamin and Zelah in the sepulcher of Kish his father. And they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God was entreated for Israel, or for, for the land. You might as well say Israel, because that's the land that was... Uh, in famine, verse 15. Moreover, the Philistines had war yet again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint, because he's getting on up in years now. Verse uh, 16. And Ishbinob, which was of the sons of the giant, and the white who of whose sphere weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight and he was girded with the new sword thought to have slain David in other words we're talking about these are the children of uh, Goliath so this Ish Benibob here or Bish Ish Benob or let me try to pronounce this correctly Ish B Benob is the son of Goliath Verse 17. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, secured him, and smote the Philistine, and killed him. And the men of David swore unto him, saying, Thou shalt no more go with, uh, out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. In other words, uh, you're not to go out into battle with us anymore. In other words, da David's on up in years now, and he's not able to get around like he was. However, he's still willing to fight. He's still got the fight in him. Verse 18. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. And Sibachai, the Hushathite, slew Saph, which was one of the sons of the giant. In other words, this would be another child of uh, Goliath. Verse 19. And there was again a battle at Gob with the Philistines. And Elhanan, the son of Jarregorim, Jer or whatever that word is, Jarreorgim, the Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, 
the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So now we've had his sons killed and his uh, his brother killed. So they're killing off the remnant of the giants here, which were left. And there was yet a battle in Gath, and there was a man of great stature who had on every hand six fingers and every foot six toes. Twenty in, uh, twenty in number. He also was born to the giant. In other words, this is another son of Goliath. But this one had six fingers and six toes. And believe it or not, they have found bones in the Middle East of giants with six fingers and six toes. Uh, they're not widely spoken of, and paleontologists are at a loss to explain them. Uh, especially those of secular science who don't want to believe in the Bible anyway. They just figure there's some kind of freak of nature or whatever. Verse 21. And when, he had and when he defiled Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. Verse 22. And these were f four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Uh, Samuel chapter 22 and verse 1. And David spake the word, spake unto the Lord the words of this song, the day that the Lord delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Verse 3. The God of my rock. In him I trust. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior that saveth me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. When the waves of death compass me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about, and the snares of death prevail, prevented me. In my distress I called upon the Lord, and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of the temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. And the earth shook and trembled, and the foundations thereof were moved and shook, because he was wroth. You recall this is what happened at Christ's death. Verse 9. And there went up smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And darkness is, of course, always symbolic of deception. And uh, this goes along with the psalm of David where it says, Till thine enemies be made thy foot. So sit here. My Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till thine enemies be made thy footstool. Verse 11. And he rode upon a cherub, and he did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Before the brightness... Before him were coals of fire kindled. Or through the brightness before him were coals kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. And the channels of the sea appeared, and the foundations of the world were discovered. At his rebuking, or at the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of a breath of his nostrils, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. Now there's a connotation of this, of being born of water, or being born from above. You've got uh, above, and he took me out of many waters here, which is the subject which Nicodemus spoke to Christ of about being born again. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, that were too strong for me. 
They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. In other words, my strength and my uh, my, my, my place of stay, my, my rock. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord hath rewarded in me according to the righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands, he recompensed me. Um, you might recall the words of that last verse 20. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Remember what those in Psalms 22 said, and those said at the foot of the cross of Christ. Let him now deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Just mention it in passing. And we're going to go back to 22. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from the Lord. For all his judgments were before me, and for his statues I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him, and kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanliness or cleanness in his sight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with the upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure thou shalt show thyself pure, and with the froward thou shalt show thyself unsavory. Froward here means evil or um, underhanded. And the afflicted people wilt thou save, but thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. And of course, our Father is our light, and light dispels the darkness. For by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God I have leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is the buckler to all them that trust him. In other words, the buckler is the one that girds on your armor. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and power. He maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hind's feet. In other words, he makes me fast. He settleth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war. And he bow the steel is, and so that the bow of steel is broken in my arms. Thou hast also given me a shield unto thy salvation. And the gentleness hath made me, he made me great. Thou hast enlarged the steps under me that my feet did not slip. I have pursued mine enemies and destroyed them, and turned not again until I consumed them. I have consumed them and wounded them, and they could not arise. Yea, they are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength to battle. Them that rose up against me hast thou have subdued under me. Thou hast also given me necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. And of course the neck is the weakest part of the body. Verse 42. They looked and there was none to save. Even unto the Lord. But he answered them not. And this is of course speaking of Saul. And even Absalom. And anyone that rose up against David. Even of the tribes. Then I beat them as the small dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mitre of the street. And did spread them abroad. Thou hast also delivered me from the strivings of my people, which thou hast kept me the head of the heathen. Or has kept me to be the head of the heathen. A people which I know not shall serve me. In other words, uh, this even goes down to his generations, people that he knew not from his future for his descendants shall serve the throne of Judah again we're back to the house of Windsor and Queen Elizabeth and every monarch that has reigned since King David of that seed line strangers shall submit themselves unto me and as soon as they hear they shall be obedient unto me strangers shall fade away they shall be afraid 
out of their close places. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, that exalted be the Lord God, or, or be the Lord the rock of my salvation. And of course, this is where we get the connotation, the Lord is the rock of our salvation. And this is even written of Christ. It is God that avengeth me, and bringeth down the people under me. And that bringeth me forth from mine enemies, thou also hast lifted me up on high places above them that rose against me. And thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen. I will sing praises unto thy name. He is the tower of my salvation for his king. He showeth mercy to his anointed, unto David, and to his seed forevermore. And of course we know through David would come the seed line of Christ. And um, also the seed which still sits upon the throne of Israel, which is the throne of the Britons to this very day. So, I think we're going to stop here for this particular lecture, and I think we'll finish up the book in the the book of Second Samuel in the next lecture. But um, I really would have liked to have covered a few more connotations in that song. But um, those of you with eyes to see and ears to hear understand the connotations. The rock of our salvation, our tower. Um, his anointed king. Who is his anointed king in reality? I mean, of course it was David in this time. It's the literal. But the anointed king is Christ. If you say Christ, you're saying the anointed one. In other words, when you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Yahshua, God's Savior, Christ, Christos, the anointed one. And uh, Christ is a word that kind of took the, uh, it didn't take the place of Messiah, but uh, Mashiach in Hebrew is the Savior. So you've got all three connotations there. At any rate, for those of you who do have eyes to see and ears to hear, you have no need that I explain these things to you. But... Uh, for those of you who are just coming to this, you need to look up these words and their connotations from the Hebrew and see the deeper spiritual meaning and learn the patterns of speech here. Because there is far more said in these chapters, even in the Old Testament, concerning Christ than most even could possibly guess, especially in the book of Psalms. But um, when Christ walked the earth... There was no New Testament. In other words, the, the books of John, the, the books of Mark, Matthew, Luke, uh, all of that, and, and even the words of Paul and the uh, Revelation and Second Peter chapter, all those books didn't exist yet when Christ walked the earth. So when Christ quoted Scripture, he wasn't quoting from the New Testament because the New Testament wasn't around to quote from. He quoted from the Old Testament. And many times he quoted as it was written of him. And there are many places in the Old Testament where you're going to find that it is written of him. Even uh, Psalms 22 speaks of his crucifixion almost verbatim, word for word. What happens in all of the Gospels according to what was going on at the foot of the cross. And every time Christ quoted from the word, he was quoting from the Old Testament. Like I said, there was no New Testament. So, he became the New Testament, and after him would come the books of the New Testament, and during his lifetime, and um, in other words, the men were gathering the information to write down, and then would come Paul, and uh, uh, John, who would write the book of Revelation, which was a vision given to him by Christ. But anyway, I hope that you are seeing the deeper types of, and spiritual connotations in these old books 
Because a lot of people gloss over them as just historical, those who do believe in the words of the book. And of course the atheists and the uh, those who don't agree with certain verses overlook them completely and they see no connotations. I don't see anything written about Jesus in the Old Testament. That was before Jesus. Are you crazy? Anyway, you you uh, you get the types and examples that I'm referring to. But anyway, we're gonna we're gonna stop the lecture here for today, and we will uh, finish up this book in the next lecture. But as always, brothers and sisters in Christ, it is my prayer for you that. You will dig deeply into this well of knowledge, this wealth of knowledge, this treasure chest of knowledge, which is our Father's Word. That you will go to the old languages and use the tools which God has afforded us to study the old languages, such as the Strong's Concordance, the Green's Interlinear, the Septuagint, if you can obtain a copy, uh, the Masoretic texts, if you can obtain a copy of those, they are extremely rare. And take the time, e even if you can't obtain these uh, books such as the Masora or the uh, Septuagint, you can get a Strong's Concordance and break down the words, and you can get a J.P. Greed's Interlinear and look at the scrolls uh, in other words, the Hebrew writing, which the translators of the 1611 King James Bible translated from. And you can get an idea. They are in New Median Hebrew, and of course, these things were written in Paleo-Hebrew, which is sometimes referred to as Phalo or Phoenician. Phoenician. But uh, you can get an understanding of what was actually written versus what... Uh, most claim, you know, uh, one example being Adam and Eve and the apple. Well, there has never been an apple written of, nor any fruit, uh, in the meaning of the word fruit, as in to uh, an orange or an apple or a pear or anything like that, spoken of in the Word of God. They are used as analogies, they're metaphoric speech, so that you can understand. But they're not actual pieces of fruit. In other words, Adam did not bite off of an apple. Eve did not bite off of an apple. And uh, I have many studies on this, such as Satan Seeds Cain's Progeny. And uh, the first lecture of the book of Genesis will tell you what the sin in the garden actually was. And most people ha uh, um, understand that it had to do with sex, but they think it was that Adam and Eve had sex. Well... If you study from the manuscripts, you will find that there was uh, a lot more to it. Anyway, again, study to show yourself pro approved. And always, always ask our Father for guidance and wisdom as you study this, His most precious word, His letter to you. He wrote it to you. Well, I thought He wrote it to everybody. He did. But everyone takes away from the word their portion. Some will take deeper portions. Some will take lesser portions. It's all according to your appetite and how willing you are to study. And how much you pray to the Father and petition Him to give you wisdom and knowledge and understanding. But always pray when you study. Before you begin a study, ask our Father to open your eyes and ears to the truth. We always do that when we begin these studies. And we always basically end with the same thing. It's always my prayer for you that you will study our Father's Word to this level, deep enough to where you will understand these things. So that you may show yourself approved before the Lord. God bless you in all you study, those of you who care to study, that your eyes may be opened, that our Father may richly bless you in the knowledge of his word. Thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.